Susan Neiman, welcome to the show. I'm glad to be here. Uh, so you wrote a book that I, I loved. It's really interesting. It's, it's a topic that I thought a lot about too. Um, it's called Why I Grow Up, where you make the case of why people should grow up, where you look to enlightened philosophers like Rousseau and Kant uh, to make that case. But before we get into those arguments, why did you feel like it was necessary to even write a book making a case on why adults or why people should grow up? Because grownups get such a terrible rap. Um, you know, the standard view in our culture and, and not just American culture, it's um, certainly in Western Europe, uh, pretty much the same, is that growing up is a matter of giving up, of resigning yourself to uh, the world as it is, of um, losing your dreams, your hopes, your passions, your uh, ideals, and uh, it's a pretty depressing prospect. The interesting thing is when I wrote the book, I mean, you never really know who you're writing for, um, but if I imagined a reader... It was somebody sort of in their late 40s who felt they had to adjust to the idea that their life was basically over. And a lot of those people have, have liked the book, but um, I've gotten some of the nicest responses and reviews from people under 30 who have said, number one, um, thank heavens somebody is telling us that uh, this is not the best time of my life. You know, sort of this, we have this idea that the time between, I don't know, 20 and 30 or 18 and 28 is supposed to be the high point of your life. And anybody who's over that, uh, over those years, I have yet to meet a single person who would like to repeat them. <laughs> and there's empirical evidence as well that there's no way in which this is the happiest time of one's life. But people... Uh, are told that, and I can certainly remember in my 20s um, feeling that, first of all, this was not true of me, but I would keep hearing, oh, enjoy the best years of your life. And then I would think, not only, uh, you know, am I struggling with figuring out who I am and what my strengths are and weaknesses and what I want to do, um, but I'm also not enjoying the best years of my life, you know. So it was this kind of thing that you beat yourself with. But uh, so I, I met a lot of people in their 20s who have said, thank you for saying this is not the best part of uh, my life. And then I have something to look forward to. That's why I wrote the book. Yeah, and, but besides this narrative that growing up is terrible um, and just not fun and you have nothing to look forward to except you know, slowly sliding into the grave. Um, you also argue that our modern culture in a lot of ways infantilizes us. So it makes it hard to, to grow. So now, can you explain that? How, how does modern culture make us, makes it, makes it hard to grow up? Sure. Um, let me um, just back up a step before I answer that, which is um, to say, look, so why if um, nobody I have met would like to repeat their 20s? I mean, you can sometimes say, if I knew what I knew now, uh, you know, but, uh, but we don't. So the, the condition would be repeat them just the way they are. Uh, they were, actually, um, full of doubt, full of um, anxiety, full of I don't know who I am and um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to meet the demands that life places on me. I don't know if I'm allowed to make a mistake um, there's the view that sort of every decision you make in your 20s is going to be absolutely faithful and you can't turn it around. So, so the question is, you have all this empirical evidence against the idea that growing up is a long, uh, th that, that the, your 20s are the happiest, best times of your life. Um, and you have empirical evidence that people actually get happier as they get older. So the question is, why are we fed this particular view? And we're fed it all the time from all the media. Um, and I think that in order to convince people that they shouldn't expect very much from their lives and they certainly shouldn't demand it. So I think in, in a complicated way, it's a political claim, the view that growing up, it, you know, basically sucks, um, <laughs> right? So then the question is, so how does the culture infantilize itself um, just at the moment, you're catching me. I normally live in Berlin, Germany, but you're catching me in Mississippi where I'm uh, taking a sabbatical and working on a new book. 
and uh, maybe you're completely used to this everywhere uh, in the States, but I was just shocked yesterday when I went to get gas, um, and uh, I re- there was a screen at the gas pump. Uh, I don't know, is that something common in now in, uh, in the States? That I mean, there is no minute of your life when there is not a screen to distract you. So, so what is the distraction doing? Okay, why? Of, of course, you can say, well, um, on a micro level, um, it's uh, it's providing advertising and selling products and making money. But uh, on a micro, on a macro level, it's making sure that we never have a moment in which we can actually reflect on what's going on. And I, in in the book, I talk about uh, what we do with with babies. So I raised three kids. Um, And uh, you know that if a baby grabs something that it's not supposed to have, you left the scissors somewhere or, you know, whatever, um, a little baby just needs to be distracted. I mean, there are two choices, okay? And there are authoritarian parents who will hit a baby still uh, who grabs something they're not supposed to have or that might do them uh, damage. Um, but less authoritarian parents, of whom I hope most of us are or will grow up to be, uh, use this other trick, which is distracting. And with babies, it's very easy to distract them. You sh- you know stick a bunch of keys in their face or a bright ring or something, and they oh they've forgotten all about what they wanted to have. As a child gets older, the distraction gets more complicated. But it's a huge form of manipulation. I mean, you know, it's carrots and sticks. And, and um, if you're raising children, you know that uh, you, are, you have to use one or the other. So um, carrots tend to be better. But what we have, and now I'm not talking about um, raising children who are going to, uh, who you, you want to prevent from, doing themselves harm, which is certainly in the first uh, years of life, that is something you need to do. But uh, talking about a whole society who dazzles us with insignificant choices, you know, between, uh, you know, Walmart or wherever it is you shop in Mississippi, there's kind of no avoiding Walmart, an entire aisle full of toothpaste. Uh, or breakfast cereal. And, of course, if you live in a culture like that, uh, you get used to it. It's, it's very interesting to move back and forth between countries because uh, the things that you take for granted if you only stay in one place um, become actually something you think about if you get a chance to compare it with other cultures, which is why one of the things I, I strongly recommend in the book as a part of the process of growing up is traveling, not as a tourist, preferably working in another culture. But in any case, um, you we don't realize how dazed we are and exhausted by the process of um, deciding which toothpaste to buy or which breakfast cereal to buy, that by the time we get out of the gigantic supermarket, we our brains have kind of had it. Um, and we we are so um, drugged, basically, by trivial choices and by the energy that it takes to make trivial choices that we forget that the really important choices are not in our hands. Um, how the world is run, uh, how, uh, you know, what, the government does with our tax money, what, uh, you know, our representatives do with, uh, uh, you know, basically with our lives. I mean, I'm, I, I would avoid at the moment talking about the political situation that we're in at the moment because it is so extraordinary and um, really defies... Um, the five kind of normal interpretations. When I wrote the book, I certainly didn't expect that um, the White House would look the way that it looks now. So I don't want to talk about, um, you know, partisan political choices, but uh, about an entire system 
which keeps us distracted just in the same way that you would distract a little baby with a keychain. Right. And what's interesting, you talk about like these choices that we have as consumers. Um, the insidious thing about that is it makes us feel like we're in control, right? Um, exactly. You know, we think, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm deciding which toaster to buy or which microwave or which app I'm going to download on my phone. But then... Which car to buy, which yeah. you know, smartphone. But yeah, it distracts you from like the stuff that really, really will affect your life on a on a big level. Exactly. And it 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 gives us the the appearance of choice in these trivial ways without realizing that actually um you know the important choices are out of our hands. So so the funny thing is um, when people tell you to grow up, what they mean is stop thinking about the big questions like, you know, why do, I don't know the numbers uh, right now of how many children die every day of preventable diseases. My favorite question at the moment, because I don't know how to answer it, was asked by Malala, uh, and it wasn't given a lot of press. Um, she won the Nobel Prize when she argued that women should be, uh, girls should be allowed to be educated, and she, you know, her life was threatened and nearly lost for that. And that was wonderful, but when she used the education that she then got to figure out that you could educate every child on the planet for 12 years on the profits the weapons industry makes in eight days. This is an extraordinary figure. I checked it with a um, major economist. He said it was right. And um, that is a, the, the question, why don't we do that, um, is a question that I don't even know how to begin to answer. But the message that we tend to get is to, you know, as we grow up, we should stop thinking about these very large questions about justice and hunger and, um, you know, um, who runs the world and why. And we should start thinking about grown-up questions, namely getting a job and figuring out how we're going to buy a bunch of toys. And the toys are, of course, not described as toys. They're described as crucial, um, you know, uh, tools for becoming an adult. And the truth is, unfortunately, a smartphone and a computer um, are, in the world we now live in, uh, tools for becoming uh, an adult in some parts of uh, this country, certainly, where there's no decent public transportation. A car is also part of that. But, you know, you get, you get it's like a, a reversal. Um, I think Malala's question is a really grown-up question. But, uh, and the question of which smartphone to buy, which app to download, is a pretty childish question in the end. But we are taught this reversal. So yeah, let's, let's talk, what do you mean by, what do you think it means to grow up? So you're, you're saying that the common idea of being grown up is, okay, you got to get a house, get a job, figure out how to buy this stuff for yourself and for your family so they have a quote unquote good life. Um, and you're arguing, well, those are actually pretty trivial. Um, so if that's not what it means to be a grown-up, how do you define it? Well, l l let me step back a second. I would not say, um, you know, that providing uh, for yourself and your family is, is a trivial question. Of course it's not, you know. Um, those, are, uh, those are sort of crucial for being able to... to do a bunch of other things. It's just that a lot of people get trapped in the idea of what it means to provide for uh, themselves and their families. And um, it tends to mean, uh, you know, it, it overtakes them uh, in ways that uh, uh, it doesn't need to, you know. I mean, um, yeah, I have a job. I, uh, I raised three kids actually by myself, so I was the uh, sole provider for them after their uh, father died quite early. And uh, I do know what it means to, um, you know, to have to work hard and, and put food on the table and a roof over people's heads. But um, first of all, it doesn't need to happen as quickly as it's 
often uh, suppose. And secondly, there are lots and lots of ways to raise a family and put food on the table. So, um, but let me just say that I think there's one thing, and it, it ties into you know this whole question. Um, one way to summarize what I think it means to grow up, and it means keeping one eye on the way the world is and one eye on the way the world should be. And unfortunately, we're often taught to close that other eye about the way the world should be and only focus on the way the world is. And uh, it's not necessary. It's not good for the world as a whole. And it makes for a pretty unhappy life. So, um, you know, keep, keeping an eye on the way the world is, um, sure, you've got to make a living. You've got to figure out how to do that somehow. Um, but uh, keeping your eye on the way the world should be, which involves both um, uh, your own personal dreams, um, which I actually think is, is perhaps the most crucial part of people's education because you don't really know your own culture until you can see it in the light of another. You just take everything for granted until you live somewhere else. Um, or, I don't know, maybe you want to become a musician. Maybe you want to, you know, they're a, a, a potter. There are a million things that people um, keep as their own personal aspiration that may not at all relate to um, making a living, but there's also being engaged in some form of making the world slightly better than it was when you entered it. And I think there's a deep human need to do that. It can be through beauty. I mean, somebody who becomes a you know a wonderful musician is is creating beauty that wasn't there before she uh, she got there. Uh, beautiful ceramics, beautiful um, art of any kind. But um, I think moving the world a little bit forward is um, part of our sense of what it means to be human. And the ways in which our culture infantilizes us is by keeping us passive. I mean, that's the, you know, I just... Saw the pump at the at the uh, the the screen at the gas pump last night. Just, this is amazing. I'm not supposed to have one thought of my own. I'm simply supposed to be taking in somebody else's stuff all the time, and uh, that means having a being a receptacle basically for um, you know other information. Um, often false information that's blaring at you so that you have no space to be an active human being to think for yourself. And uh, that is what I think uh, is part of being human, part of being grown up. You see this with children. I mean, it's interesting. Um, basically, as soon as they're able to hold a crayon or, or um, you know, make a mud pie, children are making something in the world. They're doing something in the world. They want to do it. Um, they, they don't simply want to be passively distracted. So it sounds like being grown up is a matter of balancing idealism with pragmatism. Sure. Would that, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, so let's get to these enlightenment thinkers that you look to, Rousseau and Kant. You argue in the book that coming of age or you know, becoming an adult um, is a problem of the enlightenment uh, why do you? Why is that? Why is becoming an adult an enlightenment problem? So basically, before about the 1750, um, there wasn't a lot of choice in your life. Um, what you did with the rest of your life, um, usually where you lived, unless you were fleeing a war or uh, a famine, uh, where you lived and what you did was basically where your parents had lived and uh, what they did. There just simply wasn't, uh, uh, for a whole variety of, of historical reasons, individual choice did not play much of a role in people's lives. Okay, And suddenly, again, for complicated reasons that historians uh, can, can go into, 
suddenly around 1750, the idea that you might determine some of the course of your own life. You might do something that your parents hadn't done. You might live somewhere uh, where your parents hadn't lived. You might marry someone who your parents didn't pick out for you. Um, all of that became uh, began to be open. The interesting thing is we don't realize how much choice we have. The, if you think about who really doesn't have much choice in their lives, uh, look at the royal family of England, you know. I mean, Prince George is it's very clear what Prince George is going to be when he grow up, grows up. I, I'm not saying um, that one exactly feels sorry for him. He'll be raised to expect that. It's certainly a very luxurious life. But it's also a very predetermined life. Um, in you know, uh, as part of uh, basically a feudal hierarchy that's been left over from pre-modern times. So we have certain choices. We don't always uh, realize how much choice we have, but we do have them since, you know, the last 250 years or so. And people began, therefore, to think about growing up as, uh, as a task, as a question, um, rather than taken for granted. And the first person to, to do that was uh, the French uh, philosopher and writer Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who very much influenced uh, the German philosopher Immanuel Kant. And it's interesting because they were both very different stylistically. But what they had in common is that each of them came from basically what you'd call a working class family. I mean, parents were small artisans. Um, it's not clear how literate, if they were literate uh, at all, they were. And the idea that either of those boys would become, you know, one of the leading lights of Western thought was not even something that could be conceptualized by their parents. Um, but that is what happened to them. So it's not surprising that both of those uh, thinkers wrote about the question. They also wrote about it, of course, because they thought um, it, it, it was also a point in time when you were beginning to think about general education. Uh, there were very, very few schools uh, during the Renaissance and early modern period. Uh, people of a certain class got tutored at home. People uh, who were below that class did not. But you were beginning in the 18th century to think that uh, it was important to educate boys, not girls, but um, at least to educate boys. And uh, the question was, what kind of influence? What what kind of influence does education have? on the individual person and how does the individual person then fit into or help create uh, a political society. You know, we take all this for granted in the States, but actually um, Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin, all these people were reading Enlightenment philosophy all the time. And uh, the idea that you had to have educated citizens if you wanted to have a democratic republic, is um, Thomas Jefferson wrote a lot about it, but it was a new idea at the time. We sort of take it for granted. We should take it more seriously now because uh, I don't think we have a, a citizenry that's educated in you know, picking through the... Uh, mass of information to get the um, facts <laughs> picked out from the alternative facts. But um, in any case, this is an Enlightenment idea that, that if you want to have, um, I mean, it's a progressive Enlightenment idea, obviously the people who did not want to have a more democratic uh, republic did not want to educate um, the bulk of the population, but the people who wanted a democratic republic realized you, uh, if that's going to work, and if people are not going to be fooled by um, any narcissistic demagogue who comes their way, you need to educate them. So let's talk about Rousseau. He wrote this book, Emile. Um, it was a, a work of fiction where he takes this 
kid named Emil and sort of just raises him and takes him through like what he thought was an ideal education to create, um, a, you know, an adult. Um, can you kind of summarize, I mean, what are some of the stuff that Rousseau thought that children should be put through um, in order to become a grown-up? Sure. I mean, it's a kind of crazy book. It's, it's totally unique. It is fiction, but it's also the first child-raising manual that was ever written. And it also has some, um, and it's also philosophy, but it's, it's fun to read, um, which is why people should um, take a look at it. And it really began, uh, you know, every thought about modern pedagogy. So let's say right off that Rousseau himself knew that what he was proposing was not practical. Um, and uh, he begins by saying, uh, People are telling me, propose what can be done. Um, that's not human nature. And he says, we do not know what our nature permits us to be because our nature has been um, filtered through a particular set of social practices. So let us, here, I'm just going to set out the ideal here. And the person who does it best, uh, who comes closest to that ideal, will have done the best. So um, he also begins the book by saying, everything is good as it leaves the hands of the author of nature. Everything degenerates um, in the hands of men. It's a pretty strong statement. But he wants to reverse that. Okay? I, I mean, I'm, uh, I, you asked me to talk about I don't agree with everything that Rousseau says in that book, but it's a terribly important book. The idea is um, to, that children are born natural Democrats without ideas of hierarchy. They are born uh, without ideas of authority. They are born intensely curious. And one should allow them to figure out what they should learn. Okay? So um, rather than forcing kids to... And everything we... Uh, think about progressive forms of education all began in Rousseau. You know, it, of course, at his uh, in his day, the you know non-progressive education was worse certainly than it uh, than it is now. But it, you know, it, kids were supposed to memorize everything. He said, no, follow the child's natural curiosity. Um, he actually thought the child should not learn to read until uh, he or she was twelve, which is getting pretty old. But he thought if you, if you don't force the child to do anything except through force of natural necessity, um, that the child would, um, would grow up being nobody's master and nobody's slave. So as an example, uh, you know, if, uh, if you tell a child, uh, no, you can't have a cookie before dinner, <laughs> I'm not saying we should never do this. We sometimes have no choice. Um, the child will react often, you know, um, not happily. If you tell the child there are no more cookies left, has a very different reaction. So, for example, his uh, his punishment if a child misbehaves and breaks a window is not to beat him, but to say, okay, you're going to have to... Um, sleep in uh, a room in the cold. Now, obviously, you know, again, um, not all of his suggestions are, are possible or perhaps even right. But I think the basic idea of, of uh, that, first of all, children want to learn, and they want to be active. They want to um, be a part of the world. And if you treat them with respect... They will usually live up to it. Is a deeply important idea. It, and how did Rousseau's ideas you know, influence Kant? You say they're you know different in their style, but uh, Kant actually borrowed a lot or found a lot of inspiration in Rousseau. It's one of the um, the most famous stories about Kant. So, so Kant. Um, uh, I mean, he had a huge amount to do, so he was extremely disciplined. And he took an afternoon walk every day after lunch for an hour. And it, he was so regular that they say the, the people in town set, could set their watches by him. 
and there were only two times when he didn't um, take his normal afternoon walk. Um, the second was when he heard the news of the French Revolution, but the first was when he heard when he was reading Rousseau, and he was so fascinated by it that he forgot to um, take his walk. What Kant learned from Rousseau was the idea that if, you know, and this is still a controversial idea, but if people are treated decently and with respect, they are not evil, they will behave decently and uh, with respect towards other people. Okay, So the idea that um, basically, and, and this is the way in which, which Emile is, is also a theological book, and it was banned, by the way. It was banned and burnt in Paris when it was written. He's basically denying original sin. He's saying that, no, you know what? Um, the evil that we see in people is a result of the way that they have been raised and result of the expectations that they're given and a result of the way that they're treated. And if we go back to more natural ways of um, raising children and living with them, um, which means doing without ideas of uh, domination and uh, humiliation, um, you will be able to raise good human beings. Now, it's often said, and, and that was for Kant incredibly important, okay, and it's been important for everybody. Now, this idea is often, um, you know, it's often um, made fun of. So you get, you know, people like David Brooks in the New York Times, but, you know, all kinds of people will say things like, you know, well, there are two views of human nature, one is Hobbes, and Hobbes says that a life in the state of nature is, uh, oh gosh, a nasty, brutish, and short. Solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Okay, basically that um, people in the state of nature are uh, in a state of war. And this is often called the more realistic uh, position. And Rousseau people turn their noses up at Rousseau and say, um, oh, well, um, Rousseau believed in the state of nature. Everybody was kind of, you know, peace, love, and sunshine. And uh, unfortunately, that's not the case. Now, Rousseau did not have that view at all. He simply said people in the state of nature are morally neutral, okay? And what they have is an innate idea of freedom and of action. They don't want to be dominated, so that if you raise a child um, uh, to be as free as possible um, and as undominated as possible, you can bring her to a, you know, to become a moral grown-up, okay? So it's not that children are, uh, are naturally good or never, um, never do brutal things. Anybody who's watched a, you know, two-year-old fight over a shovel in a sandbox knows that. <laughs> but, um, and, and the real point about the, the state of nature is we don't know. The question is not settled and there's no way to settle it. Okay? We can't go back there. I know the evolutionary psychologists um, have a lot of hypotheses, but it's all just hypothesis. Okay? They're not, you know, you will also get in, you know, various newspapers, popular magazines, or whatever people will say, well, evolutionary theory says that our ancestors, um, you know, were altruistic because they hoped to get a piece of somebody else's pie when, if they gave uh, a piece of their own. We don't know what people were like. Uh, 20,000 years ago, we, we were clueless. And Rousseau's insight was to say, you know what, um, the state of nature could have been this way, it could have been that way. We don't know, but we do know that what we assume about human nature will affect what we do and affect 
how we treat other human beings and what kind of a society we build. So let's think about what we'd prefer to build. Would we prefer to build a society in which people were basically respectful of each other, basically free, um, basically not infantilized, not in... Um, uh, you know, not needing to be dominated in order not to kill each other, which is basically Hobbes' view. Um, if we want to work for a just and democratic society, let's assume that people are naturally basically democratic because we don't know either way. Okay, and so, yeah, that was the whole point of Emil is you, you uh, treated your treated the child as a a democratic, free individual, and uh, he learned how to grow into that role uh, through that pedagogy. Okay. So um, let's talk about brass. Let's bring it to day. Let's say someone's listening to this. They're, a lot of our audiences are in their 20s and 30s. And I know there's a common complaint amongst people you know, in that age. Like They're officially an adult, right? They're, they have a job. Um, they might live by themselves, they have their own place, but they still don't feel like, feel like an adult. Um, what are, what are, what are some brass tack things people can do to become a grown up? You mentioned travel as one, but what are some other things? Well, first of all, they should really think hard about what being a grown up means. Um, the funny thing is, uh, when I was writing this book, um, a couple of friends of mine, people in their late 60s, I guess 70, 71 now, uh, good friends of mine said, what are you working on? I said, a book called Why Grow Up. They said, ooh, that's an awful subject. Um, and one of them said, my hero was always Peter Pan. And I thought this was amazingly funny. Three different people said this to me. And all of them are people who I would think of as fantastic uh, fantastically realized grown-ups. Um, two of them are professionally successful. One is not. All of them are very creative. All of them are involved in their communities. In some, one case, very political. No, two cases, politically active. Um, all of them, uh, all of them have children and grandchildren. Um, but did not raise them in particularly conventional ways. All of them speak more than one language uh, and, you know, have lived in more than one place. And I thought it was just, I was sterile with that each of them were a terrific model for me of being a grown-up, but they did not want to think of themselves as grown-ups because they thought growing up had such a bad rap. So, um, you know, I, I would say the first thing to think of, I mean, the first comment is, Growing up is a process, and I'm not sure that it ever makes sense to say one is grown up, because in a certain sense, that would mean that one has stopped growing, um, and that's kind of the end. So, so I'm not sure that being a grown up is an ideal, but the process of growing up is an ideal. And, uh, you know, your listeners should just know... I've met very few people. I'm in the process of, uh, af after writing this book, I talked to a bunch of people. I gave a bunch of lectures and stuff. And I um, only met a couple who said they would consider themselves to be grown-ups. And, and they, they weren't the... <laughs> they weren't the people most leading lives that, that I would like to lead. But... Um, the people who I would consider grown up didn't feel grown up in that sense either. So I think the first thing you need to do is to, um, you know, re-examine your idea of what it means to be a grown up. Because if you think what it means is to give up your hopes of having an interesting and adventurous life, to always be on one track, to not... Um, do something or other to contribute to a better world, and you say, well, gosh, I haven't given everything up yet, so I can't be grown up. Hey, guys, you don't need to give everything up to be grown up. That's great. I love that. So, I mean, the book's, you know, why grow up? I mean, so it's like, the, that's the question. Um, you know, and we talked about some of the, the voices in our culture that say it's, you know, growing up is a sucker's game, right? Um, 
because it's boring, tedious, and hard. So, like, why should people grow up? I and mean, what 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 is your answer? Like, why what 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 do they stand to benefit from growing up? Okay, so I mean, first of all, you're not going to be able to help growing old. Okay, um, and the you know so that's the that's the first part of the question. Um, so you might as well do it well, right? You might as well do it in a way that's as, what shall I say, as fulfilling as possible, as meaningful as possible. And doing that actually winds up being subversive. And see, that's what's really interesting about the Peter Pan question, um, I, that I that I realized when I was talking to to these friends who said, you know, oh, I don't feel like a grown up. I always wanted to be Peter Pan. These are not irresponsible people at all. These are, I mean, the person who said that is actually um, uh, he's uh, he's a very uh, significant political activist in Israel. Um, you know, but so so I, I thought it was hilarious that he said. <laughs> His hero is Peter Pan, and I think it's a it's a complicated thought. But stay with me for a sec. Um, by painting growing up as as a sucker's game, um, I think we're because that is the you know the prevailing view. I think we are, you know, encouraged to stay infantile, to stay like Peter Pan, not to want to grow up, okay? And, of course, infantile people are much easier to control than grown-ups. So um, if you actually realize that the subversive thing to do is not be Peter Pan, not to refuse to grow up, but precisely to... um, become grown up in the sense that I've been talking about, in the sense of thinking for yourself, in the sense of being a free human being who is active in the world, um, you know, then you're, you're actually doing something that's, uh, well, it's subversive, it's adventurous, and if all of us did it, it would have important uh, political consequences. Fantastic. Well, Susan, this has been a great conversation. Is there some place people can go to learn more about your work? Sure. Uh, I have a website, uh, S-U-S-A-N dot N-E-I-M-A-N. And you can find reviews of most of my books there, some interviews. Just click around. It's, it's, it's pretty extensive. Well, Susan, thanks so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure. A pleasure for me too. Great questions. Yeah. Enjoyed being with you. My guest today was Susan Neiman. She's the author of the book, Why Grow Up? Subversive Thoughts for an Infantile Age. It's available on Amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. Uh, you can also check out Susan's website at susan neimande where you can find uh, more of her writing and her work. And make sure to check out our show notes at aom.is slash whygrowup, where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic.